I got so discombobulated last week with uh, our microphone system that I forgot to turn on the recording part. Uh, I think we're peculiarly honored as a congregation. I hope we all see it alike. We have a relationship with Johnny and Robin, and they've spent, and I don't know exact numbers, but 20 years in the Philippines preaching Jesus, have established a school that has taught many to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think we're blessed to have Josh and Mackenzie and their interest to preach the gospel in Seattle. I pray a lot for Mackenzie. I, Mackenzie's a new Christian. I'm not sure she knew she'd be a preacher's wife, and that's a whole different kettle of fish. And now she's going to be a missionary's wife, and the kettle changes again. And uh, I think that there are expectations to the wives of those that would preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's hard because most jobs that you operate in, wives don't necessarily carry expectations also. I think we're blessed to have Doug and Misty wanting to train themselves in preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then I know that Nathan Estep also wants to work with the school and stay there after, as he's already completed his schooling and preach there in the Philippines alongside his mother and father, but with a peculiar set of expectations that are just to him. I think a congregation of our size that has that many people that they can touch those who really have an interest in evangelizing the world is an extraordinary blessing to us. I'm not sure that I know why God has blessed us to this degree, but I am sure that it's a blessing. And I'm hopeful that through each one of us is a clarification of the blessing that is ours to have contact with Christians of this level of commitment. Now this is an overview kind of a lesson. I want you to think with me. I want you to study with me. I may say some things that you haven't heard said and maybe haven't thought of before. If so, think of them. But do not imagine me to be unapproachable. If I got it wrong, I'm willing to say I got it wrong. But I'm also willing to say that I don't think I have it wrong. I think I have it right, and I think it's significant in our understanding. There's never been a time when God was not king. There never will be a time when God is not king. Now, we know that. I don't think anybody would necessarily disagree with that. But I think we haven't considered the ramifications of that. And that's when we kind of get nebulous. Now, let me tie into that. God is eternal. I don't think anyone would disagree with that. But if God is eternal, then He has always been he always will be. And exactly what's happening in our world today is exactly what he knows is happening. Well, and I've heard people say, when negative hits their lives, I don't know how God could let this happen. 
That's because your world got as small as you. That's the me environment. Well, why did he let it happen to me? I always ask him, well, who did you want it to happen to? Oh, well, um, well, I don't want to name anybody. I wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy. Then who's left that it needs to happen to? Well, I want all of this eliminated. It will only be eliminated when you and I are no longer blessed with choice. As long as we've been blessed with choice, we will choose poorly sometimes. And when we choose poorly, negative ramifications come into our world. Well, I'll be... Are you saying that's my fault? That's exactly what I'm saying. Not just you peculiarly. It's all of us. It's our fault. Romans 3.10, there's none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.23, for all of sin that comes short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin are death but the gift of God is eternal life. God put us in the garden with life. And we chose, we chose to do differently. Same way today. If life's going well for you and me, we yet periodically choose sin. Well... I don't exactly choose it. Really? Then when you sin, who did choose it? Oh, okay, but... Uh, and what we do is we imagine ours aren't really as bad as sin. There's something else. There, there's some area, but we know Bible better. We know that's not an accurate perception. It's just the way we take care of ourselves. Oh, God's eternal. He always has been. He always will be. God's universal. Another thing we know, probably no arguments on it. But when we say God's universal, that means God's running the whole world. Oh, God's running the whole world. Well, if God's running the whole world, then I begin to see from the fact that he is the creator, and we all use Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And then we go through the seven days of creation. God created. He's eternal, he's universal, and he's creator. Well, since God is creator. He totally controls his creation. That's us. That's us. He totally controls his creation. I want you to look. I want you to turn with me. I want to read Bible. I don't, I, any point I make, I've got a scripture written down. But I don't have time to look at everyone. But I want us to look at this one. Look at 1 Chronicles 29. 1 Chronicles 29, 10 through 12. Because now I may say something that you flinch ever so slightly on. Verse 10. Wherefore David blessed the Lord. That's kind of interesting. And then I think about it. No, it's not. I've heard the Lord bless this morning from the communion table. David blessed the Lord before all the congregation, and David said, Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our Father forever and ever. How long? Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in heaven and in earth is thine. 
Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Thine is the kingdom. Mm. First thing we might not totally agree with is that this world is God's kingdom. Now, sometimes we say things like the church and the kingdom are synonymous. Now, that's not right, that's not wrong, but that's not big enough. That's right, but it's only a partial right because the whole world is the kingdom of God. Huh. The whole world. That makes all the luminaries. That makes everything about us. This is the kingdom of God. Well, I look and look at verse 12. Both riches and honor come of thee, and thou reignest over all. I underline that. I underline all that. And in thine hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. I'm wanting our God to get bigger. My God rules the whole world. And I think it's foolishness for us to not like the way that it's being ruled. Because to not like the way that it's being ruled is to say that you've got an idea that's as good as God's, if not better. Ooh, I can't go there, no. Then I like the way it's being ruled. I agree that I like the way it's being ruled. You see, the problem in our world is sin. The problem in our world isn't how God's ruling it. Because the only way that God could rule His world where there was no sin is to take choice from man. God doesn't elect to take choice from man. God doesn't elect to take choice from man because He wants to spend eternity with those who choose to want to spend eternity with Him. Well, okay. I begin to see it. I look a little bit further in another scripture, and I've got more we won't go to, but look at Isaiah 37. And in verse 16, and what he's tying in here is that the Godhood of God is tied in with his kingship. He's king, but he's also God, and it's tied together like that. Isaiah 37 and verse 16, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, that dwelleth between the cherubim. Ah, oh, that's the place of God. Thou art the God. Do you see what the Bible claims for him? I can't claim to believe the Bible and then make him something different than that what that Bible makes of him. Even thou alone. You're the God. You're the only God. Of all the kingdoms of the earth. Now underline kingdoms again. I did in the first passage. I'm doing it in this one. Because I'm wanting us to see that the kingdom of God is the world. The whole world is the kingdom of God. Thou hast made heaven and earth. Well, now we agreed with that. Well, the same Bible that taught us he made heaven and earth teaches us that the world is his kingdom. You see, God doesn't need you and me to subject ourselves to him to have a kingdom. There's no rebellion in this kingdom that's going to usurp his authority because he's God. So the kingdom exists whether you and I recognize it or not. But God is giving me a logical reason to want to recognize. He is creator Therefore must be king over all and for all ways. Now I'd like for us to look at Genesis 1.26. And I think we've sufficiently laid our, our, our groundwork to proceed. Genesis 1.26. And God said, let us make man in our image. Our image 
of God is that we also have choice. God can choose to make man. And man can choose to reject God or to accept God. Hmm. After our likeness. And let them have dominion, watch it, over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. God gave us dominion. There's only one way to give us dominion, and that is that he had it to give. God had dominion, and he gave it to us. That's the same principle you'll find in the 8th Psalm. And just start reading in verse 3. It's not a long psalm, but we're not going to go there. But we're going to make our second point. God is over the elements, all the elements. There's no being, there's no thing that God is not supreme over. Yes, God knows about California shaking. He shook it. Yes, God knows about the waters rising. He made them rise. Wow. And I see that there never was or ever will be a time when God was not in control of everything. Hmm. I look in my Bible and they've told me this and I know they've told me this. I just didn't see it. The ten plagues told me that God is the God of insects and animals and all that's there. I read about Elijah being fed by ravens and I learned that God is the God of of all that flies. Oh, I looked even further. and I looked at God through Jonah. And I see that God is the God of sea life. He made a big fish. And then he told the fish to swallow Jonah. And I said, don't bite him. I don't want him hurt. <laughs> because I got a message for you. I want you to take him to this exact destination and put him back on dry land. God is the God of all that's in the sea. Well, I learned more. That was Genesis, I mean, Jonah 1 and Gen Jonah 4. I learned that God is the God of all plants. He made a gourd, and then he made a worm to eat the gourd in one day. God is the God of, of all of that. And I've, I've read that in the Bible. I've told the stories but it didn't exactly dawn on me that my God is still that God. For there is but one God. And He is eternal and universal. So wherever Jonah was is immaterial. It's where I am. God is in control of all the elements that are about us. Well, I look a little further. I've tried to get a picture of the size of my God. I learned in Exodus 9, 9 that God ruled Pharaoh. Pharaoh didn't know it, but God knew it. And therefore, God ruled Egypt through Pharaoh. Well, I read further and I noticed in Isaiah 45 that God ruled Persia through Cyrus. I read the book of Daniel and I learned that God ruled Babylon through Nebuchadnezzar. And I continued to look and I found that Cyrus and Assyria were ignorant of the fact that God was ruling them. They didn't know he was, they thought it was their idea. What do great men do? They begin to think they're smarter than everyone else and that they deserve that. And that's exactly what happened to those great men. And I'm telling you today, God rules the United States of America. Trump thinks he's commander-in-chief, but he's mistaken. Jehovah is. And immaterial of who we like in 2020, 
the commander in chief will never change. Here, God's running Great Britain. God's running, and you fill in the blank. Africa, God's running all the way through. You see, God rules. He's eternal. He's universal. And because he's the creator, he will always be able to control his creation. Hmm. I look at that and I find a great deal of solace there. God rules all people. I want you to see the kingdom of God. God rules all all people. He rules the rebellious. He rules the ignorant, whether they're ignorant by choice or ignorant any other way. God rules those that elect to be indifferent. Watch, we're getting real close to personal now. Those that would choose to be indifferent. And then God rules those that gladly acknowledge Him. God rules. What does wisdom say? Wisdom says to me that if we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that I want to be a part of those that gladly acknowledge the rulership of God. I want to be one of those that says, God, I know you're in control, and I bless you for the control that you're holding over me. Well, as creator king, God wanted to be lovingly submitted to. But you know what he got for the most part? He got rebellion. He wanted to be lovingly submitted to. Look at your garden. Get back to the beginning. He wanted to be lovingly submitted to. But they didn't. Mostly we give him rebellion. Rather than destroy us as he did once before with the flood. Love this time took the reaction of destroying us by redemption and encouraging us to love him. That destroys the enmity. The fact that we've chosen to love him. Love dealing with sin. Extended grace. The king would destroy his enemies by making them his friends. That's what he's done with some of us. He destroyed enemies by making us be his friends. If you love me, keep my commandments. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. John 15, 14. He destroyed the enemy by making us want to be his friends. The king is no less king. If his subjects do not acknowledge him, He's yet king. I've tried to illustrate this. We'll see how close I get. I did not do well. Uh, matter of fact, I asked Josh to make that diagram for me as late as last evening. I've been mulling it and mulling it and mulling it, trying to make it make sense, trying to make it to where I could say it to you. The outer circle, not outside of the circle, the outer circle. Put a Roman number one in there. And Roman number one is everything invisible. Everything that you and I don't really know about. There's some things we do know about. Angels, they belong in that outer circle. Demons. They belong in that outer circle. Everything invisible belongs in that outer circle that you put a one in. Move in one circle and put a two. And that's everything visible that you and I know about. What, 
what is visible? Clouds, stars, moon, sun, everything visible that you see. But then I move in to the next little circle, number three. And I see evil men and nations. While subject to God's power, they choose to live outside of His loving favor. They choose to live outside of His loving favor. Ooh, I hope that's not you or me. I hope that's not you or me. But the fourth little circle is inclusive of all the ancient worthies. Now that's interesting right there because boy that ties in with Hebrews 11 and 12. It's inclusive of all the ancient worthies who are cheering for you and me to be a worthy with them. That includes the prophets, the patriarchs, and the modern disciples. But you know, we could say God rules, but God rules in His kingdom, and His church is but the fourth in that number. The first three, God's still His kingdom. His kingdom is everything invisible. His kingdom is everything visible. His kingdom is all the people elect to not acknowledge Him as God. His kingdom, the church, are those that gladly acknowledge Him as God. I know where I want to be. I'm hoping that that is but an illustration for you that tells you where you want to be. I'm hoping that we see that if God's eternal, universal, and creator, then I, as created, am definitely going to be a subject in His kingdom. I just want to be a subject in His kingdom, the church. Not those that don't gladly accept Him, but those who do gladly accept Him. You can't get away from it. So wisdom declares I draw close to Him, as close as I can. Not just God is God, but I want to understand as much detail as I can understand about my God. Ephesians 4, 6 says, There's one God, which is above all and through all and in all. Hmm. But Ephesians 4, 4 says, there's one body and one spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling. 5 says, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There is some detail that I need to look into to acknowledge the one true God, the only true God. That's what he said in Isaiah 29 where we started. I'm in His kingdom, but I want in the inner circle of His kingdom. I want to be that which He says that He will save. What's He going to say? Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And hath put all things under His feet and gave Him to be head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him that filleth all in all. Well, then 4.4 4 said there's one body of Ephesians. 5.23 says that he's the Savior of the body. Hmm. I need to want to be a part of that, which is the inner circle of God's kingdom. I, I don't want to be the invisible. I don't want to be the visible. I don't want to be those who are part of his kingdom but who do not gladly accept him. They're under his rule but they don't gladly accept Him. I want to be one that gladly accepts God and everything about Him that's set forth. I'm begging 
that that's something that would be interesting to you if it hasn't already been. And if we could be of any help, let us know as together we stand and sing. There's a fountain.